Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Planning Committee, I'd like to welcome you back to the 31st Annual Georgia Bar Media and Judiciary Conference. For the second year, presented with organizational support of the Georgia First Amendment Foundation. I'm Peter Canfield with Jones Day and serve as the conference chair. This morning's session on the AG race was a very interesting one. For a full rundown on the conference, please check the chat. When the session starts, we'll post links there to the agenda, panelist bios, and reference materials. A reminder that if you are a judge or attorney seeking CLE credit, please be sure to identify yourself on screen by the name you registered. That will permit us to confirm your attendance. If you have questions for the panels, please post them in the chat. The panelists and moderator will be able to see them and will do their best to get to them as time permits. We could not produce this conference every year without our the names are now on the screen. I want to give particular shout outs to the State Bar of Georgia, to CNN, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the Daily Report, all the judges, councils, and the administrative office of the courts. And thank you as well to our supporting law firms. Now we're turning to a particularly timely topic, disinformation and polarization. Is libel law a cause? or a cure. The discussion to follow was organized and will be moderated by Claire Norens and John Peters. Claire is the director of the First Amendment Clinic at the University of Georgia School of Law. John is a media law professor at, that, at the university in both the School of Law and the College of Journalism and Mass Communication. They've assembled a star team of panelists to discuss this topic today. Claire? Thank you so much, Peter, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. We're excited to have you with us for this discussion of the pros and cons of libel law in our current time, how it might be revised for better or for worse, and some of the alternative methods that exist for combating false statements and misinformation. So we are grateful to have three excellent panelists with us today, and I will briefly introduce each of them, but I encourage you to also read their full bios, which should be in the conference materials that you received. So I will start with Lee Levine. Um, Lee retired from the Ballard Spar law firm in 2020, but he spent 40 years representing media clients in state and federal courts around the country. He argued in the U.S. Supreme Court for the media defendants in two seminal U.S. Supreme Court cases, Hart Hanks Communications v. Connaughton and Bartnicki v. Bopper. He is the co-author of three books, most recently one about Justice William Brennan's fight to preserve the legacy of New York Times v. Sullivan, which is particularly relevant for today's panel discussion. And his newest book, which is still in progress, will focus on the reporter's privilege. So, Lee, thank you so much for joining us. Um, next, we have Nora Benavides, who is the Director of Dig Digital Justice and Civil Rights at the nonprofit organization uh, Free Press. She leads that organization's efforts to protect against digital threats to democracy and to push for media and platform accountability. She previously served as the Director of PEN America's U.S. Free Expression Programs, where she launched their Disinformation Defense and Media Literacy Program. And before that, she was here in Georgia working in private practice and also at the ACLU of Georgia on a range of constitutional and First Amendment issues. So Nora, thank you so much for being with us today. And third, we have Tom Clare, who represents Dominion Voting Systems in defamation lawsuits against Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, and MyPillow CEO, Mike Lindell, based on the spread of harmful untruths and conspiracy theories about uh, Dominion's role in the 2020 presidential election, or alleged role rather. Um, his practice is devoted to defending clients in very high pro profile reputational attacks in the media. His clients range from Fortune 500 companies to university presidents, to celebrities and star athletes, to journalists, and to military officials and many others. So Tom, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. 
And I'm gonna turn it over to John to start off with our first round of questions. Thank you, Claire. And I'm going to begin with Lee. Uh, and I've got a, a threshold question for you. Um, what does New York Times Sullivan and the actual malice standard currently require a libel plaintiff to prove? Ah, a good exam question. Um, the answer is that it requires them to prove by clear and convincing evidence, not the uh, preponderance of the evidence, which is the usual standard in a civil case, that the defendant uh, published the alleged libel with actual malice. Actual malice does not mean actual malice in the conventional sense that uh, most people would understand. It doesn't mean ill will, hatred, spite. Uh, it means rather knowledge of falsity or reckless disregard of the truth. But reckless disregard of the truth doesn't mean what you normally would think it means. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, kind of uber negligence, uh, like reckless driving. Uh, it means that you, in fact, entertain serious doubts about the truth and published anyway, or had a high degree of awareness of probable falsity and published anyway. Uh, if you boil it all down, what it means is that the plaintiff has to prove that you published something that you knew was false or probably false. And Lee, would you say that it is intentionally difficult to, to prove? I guess what I'm getting at here is, in other words, is this a feature or a bug developed by the U.S. Supreme Court? Feature or a bug? Um, yes, it's intentionally difficult. It's uh, designed to protect uh, the honest error, the unintentional mistake. Uh, it draws a line between um, deliberate falsehoods on the one hand and falsehoods that are inevitable in free debate and public debate on the other. Uh, and it does that in order to protect, as the Supreme Court said, our commitment to uninhibited, robust, and wide open debate about public issues. And then, Lee, again with you, as you know, two Supreme Court justices have recently called for the reconsideration of the Sullivan case, uh, most recently in dissents from the court's decision not to take a libel case brought by, uh, it was the son of a former prime minister of Albania. Uh, what do you make of their calls to reconsider Sullivan? Um, it's terrifying. Um, uh, the timing of it strikes me as absolutely bizarre uh, during a time when uh, we have seen uh, a use of the libel laws uh, by powerful people to uh, punish the, the press uh, with some frequency um, with a former president who's calling for opening up the libel laws and calling the press the enemy of the people. Um, it, it's the, the timing of it to me is just shocking and it's terrifying that um, uh, this may be the start of a movement uh, that might actually result in the Supreme Court taking a case uh, and uh, reconsidering uh, New York Times versus Sullivan. Uh, to me, that's no different than the Supreme Court taking a case to reconsider Brown versus Board of Education. Um, both are seminal pillars of our constitutional system. And um, uh, I think it's very scary. Thank you. So Tom, continuing with that theme, we hear from Lee that he's terrified that the Supreme Court would consider you know, reshaping the Sullivan standard. Um, what are your thoughts on calls to reconsider Sullivan and the actual malice standard? Sure. Well, I'll, I'll take the uh, the other side of the the discussion, um, and and maybe not for the reasons that uh, that you would think. Um, just in in hearing Lee's excellent description of what Sullivan requires, and and kind of having him, who is uh, at the top of his profession, explain uh, what it requires, there is value to the Supreme Court in uh, giving a more authoritative discussion about what what Sullivan requires in defamation cases, because the lower courts struggle mightily with applying that standard that Lee just outlined, um, because actual malice doesn't mean what, what you think it means. And, and it, it, it sounds like it's a, 
objective standard, but it really has subjective elements to it. And the way the courts have applied it are really all over the place. And it leads to a, a very difficult um, to administer a set of, of legal principles. And so I do think there is value in just having some, some clarity from the Supreme Court one way or the other about how it applies and when it applies and to whom it applies. Uh, that's point number one. Point number two, um, I do think that the Sullivan standard is uh, intentionally difficult to pick up on the prior question. Um, and, and that creates real real problems and real obstacles for people to, to obtain uh, redress for reputationally damaging statements that are made to them in, in the press. Um, and newsrooms, and they're very able newsroom lawyers, uh, count on it. And it prevents the press, in my view, from doing the right thing uh, many times because they know they have the protection of this very high standard uh, for accountability. And it informs the decisions that they make in newsrooms. Forget about courtrooms. It informs the decisions that they make in newsrooms about, um, you know, setting the record straight, making corrections, making retractions, um, doubling back on, on reporting that they've done because they know they have the backstop of it. So I think it has the unintentional but still nevertheless important consequence of of uh, making the, the media maybe a, a less um, accountable uh, entity for, and, and that has impacts on, on de decision-making. Uh, I'll say one last thing in that while I understand the, the, the terror that many on the other side of the bar feel about potentially re-examining New York Times versus Sullivan, I also think that, that mm -hmm. as a practical matter, um, I'm not convinced that the court is actually gonna take this up. Uh, and even if they did, and even if they abolish the standard entirely, defamation is a state law claim. Uh, and that I think what you would see very quickly is um, state uh, courts um, quickly fashioning similar standards so that it would become a patchwork. It would not become the same constitutional top-down New York Times versus Sullivan standard. Uh, but I do think that we would still see, it's not like robust protection from the press would fall off the earth in two so you may have answered this next question in part, but a lot of your practice is representing defamation plaintiffs in very high profile matters. And so I'm wondering if you can speak to any of the specific challenges that your clients face when trying to use the current constructs of libel law to combat harmful untruths. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, honestly, it's a very pragmatic one. Um, I have some of the some of the uh, most uh, financially successful clients um, in, in the world, people with very high net worths, companies with, with very strong resources, um, et cetera. And the cost of litigating a libel suit um, is uh, astronomical and, did, and an incredible deterrent for them. Imagine uh, the hypothetical I like to use is imagine somebody who has a net worth of $10 million, which in our world would put them in the, you know, the top single digit percent of people with net worths. Um, and to bring a case against a, a news outlet for a libel that has been committed or they believe that has been committed against them uh, will cost them 40% of their net worth, $4 million in order to do that um, against a media outlet that has insurance, uh, and is, well, certainly will also have costs associated with it, but is largely insured for, for their defense of the case. They have the ability to outlast and outspend almost all at the, the, the $10 million net worth client. And so between the anti-slap laws, which impose additional procedural requirements for plaintiffs uh, who want to try to take advantage of the labor, uh, the libel laws between New York Times versus Sullivan and the very short statutes of limitations and the, the confusing standards of proof, um, Unfortunately, getting your reputation back is uh, a rich person's a rich person's game, and and I, I really think that that's a, a challenge. We have so many clients, potential clients, that come to us with meritorious claims under the law, but just can't afford to take on uh, take it on. And and this is not an area of the law where contingency fee arrangements are are the solution, because a lot of times they don't want money; they want their reputation back, they want a vindication, they want a correction, they want a court. Uh, jury verdict that says that this law, this was libel, and in, in that setting, you know, I can't pay my lawyers and keep my electric bill on with those retractions, even though that's a complete victory for for the client. So, that's a big challenge. Is the economic climate makes it very difficult to uh, to obtain that redress. Thank you. And Nora, I'd like to bring you in here and. Uh... 
Before I ask you about your work at Free Press involving DirecTV, um, I'd just like to ask you first, do you have any comments or responses to uh, what, what Lee and Tom have said about uh, Sullivan and uh, calls to reconsider it? Sure. Thanks, John. And thanks for having me here. Uh, I always love supporting you guys and the, the media conference every year. It's really wonderful. Um, I'm also so glad that you asked if I have a reaction because I had vehement reactions and I told myself I was taking notes to, to later uh, challenge Tom that I would come back to the comments that he made about libel. Um, so, so thank you. And I hope in this virtual age, we can make this as spicy and exciting as possible. Um, you know, I, it's interesting listening, Tom, to your just very practical and financial comments about how plaintiffs suffer. When I come to the defamation world uh, and arena, it's really as a First Amendment lawyer and balancing what I think the press freedom concerns are nowadays. And there's been some tremendous writing. I'm sure um, many of you know, and of course, Lee must be aware. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with you, Lee. Um, but really the, the kind of flip side of some of what Tom has uh, spoken about is the cost for journalists to challenge uh, the types of claims that are brought against them when they are perhaps not meritorious uh, and instead are used to silence or chill and otherwise scare journalists. Um, and so there is quite a long line of case law, even going back to Sullivan, of third parties funding libel and defamation lawsuits as a mechanism to silence media. Um, What's really interesting, just as sort of the, the thesis of that, the research on what the case law means in this body is, in fact, if you have the money as a defendant, as a media defendant to challenge these lawsuits, you will usually, usually win. But the cost is so great. And the Swiss cheese of district court rulings now around the entire country are quite haphazard which means it's really up to any given plaintiff potentially with ill intent and with the interest in silencing media or fundamentally altering an appellate you know, set of case law to really move our, our entire jurisprudence in this area. And so I have concerns on the flip side about those types of freelancers, um, small outlets that cannot afford to challenge and stay in a set of litigation challenges over years. Um, so it's in interesting just hearing Tom because I also am so excited to get into the Dominion case and where there are these obvious tensions between disinformation and, and then free speech and how do we balance those. Thank you, Nora. And now let's get into your work at Free Press, uh, where you recently coordinated um, a successful campaign to convince DirecTV to drop One American News Network from its pro programming uh, package. And so you know, this is because of its role in perpetuating the, you know, the so-called big lie about the outcome of the 2020 presidential election um, and celebrating the January 6th attack at the U.S. What benefits does this kind of approach have over traditional libel litigation? Well, I don't think that there is a better uh, or stronger benefit that this type of advocacy has. I think that we really need an all of the above approach when it comes to issues of disinformation. And frankly, we're, as experts, really scrambling to think about what, what meaningful intervention looks like. Um, we have had this concept of false and misleading information for centuries and uh, and the tensions then of how false and misleading information gets described and characterized is one that I just find really fascinating both from the legal and the moral imperative perspective. Um, when it comes to the work that we've done with DirecTV and uh, their decision ultimately to stop carrying OAN, I'll give you just like a 30 second backdrop to, to how we came to that work and then what I ultimately think we need in the broader scheme of things. Um, but the, the backstory is that Reuters released uh, an investigative report in October of 2021 revealing that AT&T helped fund the inception of OAN. Um, and there were a number of documents linked to that. OAN's founder and CEO revealed that 90% of OAN's income comes from AT&T owned TV platform, DirecTV. 
And he said in one comment that OAN was of zero value without the deal that they have with DirecTV. And so I frankly, along with a number of colleagues in the civil rights community thought long and hard about how we might tackle this. Uh, I think that we, we have a pretty strong record of AT&T's history in funding and fomenting anti-democratic practices. And they are a majority owner. Uh, they have a 70% equity stake in DirecTV and they appoint half of DirecTV's board. And so in thinking about how to come at this question, the, the thing I started with was what are the harms caused right now when we consider an outlet like OAN? Uh, and can we even call them a news outlet? You know, OAN undermines democracy, as you said, with very dangerous information about election integrity. It also provides a platform that very openly calls for violence as a response. Uh, it has promoted public health disinformation to the point that even YouTube has kicked OAN off its platform for violating its terms and policies. And I think there's just this sort of question of how do we combat this? What do we do? And so it was over some period of time consulting with DirecTV and in concert with at least 15 other civil rights organizations that I really kind of advised and with my colleagues at Free Press thought very carefully about how do we help a corporation make a business decision that is uh, hopefully one that doesn't limit speech. OAN is still a platform you can find on many other sources and websites, but I think that we have to start asking ourselves much larger questions about are of disinformation. How do we draw that line and definition both legally and otherwise? And then how do we find ways to help coach, advise companies that are wrestling with, they have opened up space for people to hear whatever, and it was a forced offering for any customer that came to DirecTV and signed up. Thank you, Nora. Uh, coming back to you, Tom, um, Nora was just talking about a a tactical alternative to using libel law to combat false information. Um, and so if, if we return to, to legal doctrine for a moment, apart from New York Times Sullivan and, and, and actual malice, what are some of the other legal constructs that you think should be revisited by the courts um, if there's going to be a true re-examination of, of libel law and the issues that libel cases raise? Um, sure. So uh, we've all remember that there are these rules around who's a public figure and who's a private figure and the different standards that apply in, in libel cases uh, when uh, you're a public figure and the, the requirement of proving actual malice in certain cases for purpose for purposes of being a, a public figure. Um, that doctrine has uh, really uh, exploded in the internet era with the number and the types of people that are now considered by the courts to be limited purpose public figures because people who have social media profiles, people, everybody has access to the media in some way or shape or form by virtue of social media and by virtue of, of our online and connected world. And so I think um, a re-examination of who is a uh, public figure is something that's important to consider. I think even doing something as mundane and nuts and bolts as, as let's extend a statute of limitations for libel cases. Uh, in most jurisdictions, it's one year and, and, that, and there's no discovery rule in most jurisdictions. And so you could be defamed on a corner of the internet and, and the consequences do not come to roost for years later. And then by the time those consequences destroy your business, uh, because somebody has now unearthed this thing on the corner of the internet, you're out of luck without a remedy because there was a one or two year statute of limitation. I also think that there are things like um, the way that defamation awards are treated from a tax standpoint. They're treated, unfortunately, they're taxed uh, as um, uh, taxable income to the plaintiff. And that creates a incredible financial issue uh, in trying to litigate these cases. And in also trying to encourage people to, to take them uh, on something other than a straight hourly basis. And so these are some, some kind of nuts and bolts things that I think are important to, to, to bring this area of the law back into, uh, back into mainstream. The, the last 
uh, piece of it also are these anti-slap laws that I that I mentioned earlier. We have 40 some odd states that have some version of an anti-slap law, and there's a huge debate right now about the extent to which they apply in federal court uh, and don't apply. And we have a circuit split on that issue. And it creates a uh, incredible patchwork of jurisdictional issues for plaintiffs and defendants alike. And I also think that it um, encourages forum shopping to be uh, to be perfectly candid among plaintiffs and defendants alike as we play this chess game of where we want to to bring these cases and where we want them to end up and which law we want to apply. And so I think some clarity, if the Supreme Court could do one thing that would be uh, perhaps less uh, exciting than reexamining New York Times versus Sullivan, but that would bring a clarity to a lot of practitioners, it would be to determine once and for all whether the anti-slap laws apply in federal court. So Lee, coming back to you and the issue of actual malice, um, Tom mentioned he doesn't think it's actually that likely that the Supreme Court will take up um, New York Times v. Sullivan um, anytime soon. Um, what's your view on that? Do you think that we're likely to see Supreme Court review? And if so, why or why not? Um, I think it's a it's it's a 50 50 proposition. Um, I, I think that um, you've got two justices on record. You only need two more. Um, uh, Justice Thomas has been very uh, good um, over the years at planting these little seeds that seem way out there when he first raises them in a dissent from denial of certiorari. And then, uh, you know, three years later, uh, the court's taking it in uh, a case and ruling the way he suggested it, it would. Um, so I'm, uh, I, I am not at all uh, as sure as, as Tom is that they're, they're not going to take a case. Uh, now, um, uh, called Coral Ridge Ministries versus uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center, um, which I was involved in before I retired, um, in which um, the, the plaintiff uh, has asked the court to reconsider Sullivan. Uh, the court asked for, affirmatively asked for a response to the petition after SPLC waived its right to, to do so. So that means at least one justice uh, is intrigued enough by it to, to want to get a response. Um, the response and reply have now been filed, and um, uh, you know we'll see that it, that case is, uh, in some senses, has uh, has the earmarks of one that the court might want to take because it's um, brought by a, a religious organization uh, and the court uh, has in the last few years had quite an affinity uh, for religious organizations. Um, uh, but there are other reasons they might not. Um, but uh, Tom knows this as well as I do. Uh, uh, one of the de rigueur things now when you file a defamation complaint is uh, you uh, you preserve the issue of whether uh, Times v. Sullivan ought to be overruled and you put it in your uh, in your brief so that um, uh, you, you aren't deemed to have waived it. Um, and you know, so these cases are going to keep coming before the justices as at least an opportunity. Um, and so I, and I'm, I'm very worried about it. I won't take the time to, to go through the checklist of all the justices who, uh, who might be uh, there to provide the third and fourth vote for, for taking it up, but uh, it, it seems well within the, the realm of reason to me. Um, and let me just, um, I'll put in a plug. Um, there is an organization that uh, Peter Canfield's uh, actively involved in called the Media Law Resource Center uh, that is a, a kind of serves as an information clearinghouse for uh, media companies and their lawyers. Uh, and it will be issuing on March 9th, which is the 58th anniversary of Sullivan, uh, a really, really comprehensive white paper um, written uh, by a number of, of experts in the field uh, that, uh, in my view, very powerfully um, rebuts the arguments that both Justice Thomas and, and Justice Gorsuch make uh, with respect to why Sullivan ought to be revisited. Uh, and, I, and when it comes out, I commend it to, uh, to anyone who is opposing a cert petition, uh, asking the court to, to reconsider Sullivan or is interested in the subject, because I, I really do think it is, is quite powerful. 
Well, thanks to the Media Law Resource Center for putting that together for all of us who practice in this area. Um, so we recently had the conclusion of the Sarah Palin trial um, where she had sued the New York Times for uh, making a false statement that um, linked her to the Arizona shooting where Representative Gabby Giffords was injured and several people died, including a nine-year-old girl. Um, and the court did find as a matter of law that Palin had not carried her burden to show actual malice, notwithstanding that there was a false statement that was quite damaging in nature. Um, so there's been a lot of commentary about um, this being a strategic case um, intended to try to entice the Supreme Court to take up the issue of reviewing New York Times v. Sullivan. Also a lot of speculation about who's financing the litigation. Um, do you think that this is a compelling case if the court were inclined to take a look at Sullivan again? Um, first on your, your point about funding, Tom knows who's funding it, so you should ask him. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it, by way of disclaimer, um, I was uh, counsel of record for the Times in that case until my retirement. Uh, and I, in fact, unsuccessfully argued the appeal of the first dismissal in the Second Circuit against Tom and his uh, partner slash spouse, uh, Libby Locke, uh, who, who uh, beat my butt uh, <laughs> in, in the Second Circuit. Um, uh, one of the, this is one of the great misconceptions about the Palin case. Um, it is, it is, first of all, it was not intended uh, to um, be a vehicle to attack Sullivan. It was filed, uh, I don't know about Tom, five years ago before Justice Thomas, you know, raised this, um, you know, previously unfathomable notion that Sullivan ought to be um, uh, reconsidered. So it, it, A, it wasn't filed for that purpose, and B, uh, it is a very poor vehicle for um, Supreme Court review because one of the pretrial rulings in the case by Judge Rakoff, speaking of anti-slap statutes, was that uh, under the new New York, relatively new New York anti-slap statute, uh, as a matter of state law in New York, uh, Palin has, would have to prove actual malice. Uh, so there's an independent state law basis for imposing the actual malice standard, which means that overruling Sullivan wouldn't change the result in the case if there was, if there isn't, in fact, an absence of actual malice, which is, of course, what the, the court and the jury both found. So um, if the Supreme Court takes a case, it's almost certainly not going to be Palin, at least on that issue. Tom, is there anything you want to add to that? And may I ask, who is funding the litigation? <laughs> Well, uh, I, 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 if we ever find out uh, if, if someone is funding it, I'd, I'd like to step in line to get paid for the work that we did in kicking Lee's butt because uh, uh, we, we, we did not uh, receive compensation for that. So um, I, uh, uh, I don't know the answer, to be honest. Uh, we, we, our role in that case was limited to the Second Circuit appeal that Lee referenced, and we didn't have any involvement on the, in the initial filing of it or this most recent trial. So uh, it would be uh, irresponsible for me to speculate, but uh, I can say that uh, no, but there were no secret funder paying our firm. Um, okay, kicking it back to John. Sure, yeah, Tom, uh, let's talk about Dominion. Um, how, how did the Dominion cases that you're litigating fit into the constellation of libel cases and issues that, that we've discussed uh, so far today? Yeah, I think these are really important cases um, uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, I mean, number one, uh, there's a, a lot of benefit to the idea of, of taking off and deplatforming people that spread misinformation, uh, whether it's OAN or you know any of these individual speakers that are out there spreading false information that undermines democracy. Uh, certainly, a lot of value to doing that that I see. One of the, the deficiencies in, in that approach or the thing that it doesn't address is um, the harm that is are done to real people and real companies that, uh, that are on the receiving end of that false and misinformation. <laughs> Dominion and its employees have been completely destroyed by this, uh, just completely destroyed as a company. Uh, the security issues that it has created for the individuals who are just trying to uh, assist with providing election technology 
is 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 really a, a very sad and, and human toll and there there does need to be some opportunity for them to redress that against the people that have have brought and spread that false information so I think it's important they're important cases from that perspective but but also they're really important because uh, this is not a case where more speech is the answer if you go on Twitter or you go on the internet chat rooms or anywhere uh, there isn't a place you can go to get an adjudicated up or down did this happen or did it not and you look at the polling numbers and there are enormous percentage of our population that still believes that Dominion rigged the election and that our, our democratic elections are anything other than free and fair, and that they're subject to manipulation by hidden forces. And I think it is a, a public imperative that we have a public trial on that question um, because it is the only way, it's, it is admittedly an imperfect way, but it is the only way that our legal system has to get to an answer, a, a full trial after discovery and an, a jury verdict that says this was false and defamatory or it was true. Uh, and you know that's not going to be a resolution for a lot of people. They're going to believe it notwithstanding what the court does. But I do think it's important for these cases uh, for to restore some faith in, in our democratic system and, and our electoral processes. And they're really important there. Tom, if I could ask a really quick follow-up question here. Um, could you tell us where these cases are right now? How, how far along in the process? What's the latest docket entry? Sure. So uh, there are cases that are filed in the federal district court in District of Columbia. Uh, and then there are also cases that are filed in Delaware State Court. Um, we've had motions to dismiss in uh, all of the individual cases. So again, Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell and the MyPillow guy and MyPillow uh, motions to dismiss have been argued and briefed. And the court has uh, denied the motion to dismiss in that case. And we are organizing ourselves for discovery in those cases around uh, hopefully a coordinated schedule. Same is true in the Fox case uh, against Fox News that we filed in Delaware State Court. Uh, motion to dismiss has been granted and we're starting discovery. So, um, you know, what is happening now is we're moving to the, 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 the you know, the non-public part of things where we are exchanging discovery documents and we're beginning depositions and we're hopefully going to get a fully developed factual record so we can get these cases to trial as quickly as we can. Our goal is to, is to try to get these cases to trial uh, the next year if we can, uh, some or all of them, so that we can get you know, clear answers, not just for, not just for Dominion, but hopefully we can get this done before the political season uh, hijacks, you know, what is meant to be a just straightforward uh, defamation claim. Thank you. So Nora, is there anything you'd like to comment on or respond to regarding the Dominion cases? I know it's something you've been following. Well, legally, no. Um, I mean, I, I haven't litigated in you know, a couple of years now, but I, I guess there was something Tom, you said that really kind of piqued my interest and my concern as well, which is what the impact is and how do we, how do we describe harm? Because I don't believe it was Dominion employees alone that have been harmed by these types of narratives. And yet we are not in a position to really fully grasp the harms or have those documented vis-a-vis -vis the public. Um, you know, we know that there not only does a large percentage of the American public and uh, believe that the election was in fact stolen, but that number is on the rise. Um, it, it has gone up over the last year and a half. Um, and that poses really difficult questions, um, at least where our first amendment and then the impact of disinformation are concerned. And so um, I don't know if that's really a reaction so much as just seeing this. And I, I just, I'm not sure, I know we're gonna get into some of the other legal uh, responses and interventions that we may consider in stemming and, and hopefully blunting disinformation. But the question when it comes to harm still is not one that we figured out legally and at least not what the bounds are of what, um, are cases that would be taken up with, um, with good intent and to actually figure out how we create case law and precedent that isn't problematic, at least from a free expression perspective. 
So turning to another sort of alternative to traditional libel law, um, we've seen a trend internationally of governments passing criminal laws that prohibit publishing and disseminating false information. And the concern there is that totalitarian governments are going to use these laws to suppress dissent and punish their critics. Um, so stateside, have we seen any recent criminal prosecutions based on the spread of disinformation? And if so, do you think that's a constructive approach or are there just too many unintended consequences in terms of the chilling of speech on matters of public concern? Uh, great question. And what Claire didn't mention is that we had the honor of working together on one of these cases. Um, so. I, that was a lot of fun, Claire, when we, we got to work together. Let's do it again. Um, you know, I, a couple of years ago, uh, when COVID started, one of the first examples we saw of something in the U.S. and a domestic attempt to introduce criminal statutes to uh, somehow, you know, create sanctions for purveyors of false content, um, the first example was in Puerto Rico. And that is where the governor created a constitutional amendment that would uh, have increased and created those types of penalties. Uh, at that time, what Claire and I got to work on was an amicus brief uh, supporting journalists that brought a case on behalf of um, the kinds of issues they were worried to talk about or report on. And so that was when I worked at PEN America and really focused more exclusively on free expression issues and press and the kind of chilling effect that this can have. Um, certainly globally, this is a, a rising trend. I think uh, what we've seen is governments that lean towards or are in fact authoritarian, uh, both in practice uh, and even sometimes how they describe the way they treat dissent. Um, we've seen that these types of laws are really used to crack down on anyone critical of the government. Um, here in the US, there is a separate rise, I think, of test cases from DOJ. There are two in particular that um, I'm not worried about. I think that these are necessary, actually, but these are very different from the creation of new statutes that would create a pathway for sanctions against purveyors of false information. These are using existing state and federal laws um, to impose sanctions for those that are already uh, you know, for laws that are on the books. So in January of 2021, DOJ brought a case against someone in Florida charged with conspiracy to commit election fraud. Um, he had established an audience on Twitter with, I don't know, like, I think it was 58,000 followers, something like that, just under 60. Um, he was ranked by MIT's Media Lab as a hunt, like the top 100 most important influencers regarding the election in the lead up to 2016. And then he went about spreading um, very clearly false information and uh, included texting people, messaging them privately, <clears throat> encouraging supporters of one of the presidential candidates at the time uh, to not vote or otherwise that their vote wouldn't be counted. Um, so I think that case is necessary. In November of 2021, there was a separate case brought against two Iranian uh, individuals who had been involved in a um, cyber campaign to intimidate American voters. And that also is an interesting and I think necessary case. They've been charged with voter intimidation, computer fraud, um, interstate threats. So I think these are necessary. I would put like a little asterisk to these though, which is we need to watch them. And I have talked with DOJ uh, attorneys in the past and tried to help consult with them as well because, you know, this, these are clearly criminal acts, but I worry what a potential future administration might do with unfettered ability to bring these cases against whatever they deem to be false information. And so that's something that from the perch that I sit at, really looking at a sort of like just step back level, what are the implications of disinformation and how governments are censoring or uh, criminalizing speech, I think that's something for us to watch for. I don't think we're currently at risk of the kinds of criminal statutes here in the US we've seen abroad, but again, something to look for. We've seen efforts at the state level to impose things like this. Um, very early efforts in Georgia were uh, for state officials to be able to review press notes from 
open meetings to determine whether or not they were allowed to be published. Um, and if anything seemed to be false or leaning towards that, then a journalist could have their press pass revoked, any number of other things. That was a proposal a couple of years ago that didn't move. But these are things that are beginning to have little tiny whispers of the same concerns I have abroad. So our next question is going to be directed to all three of you, but Nora, we'll start with you. Um, so where do you think the courts have succeeded and where have they failed in applying libel law in the context of all the rapidly evolving technology that we have now that's enabling and amplifying so much more speech than was possible in prior eras? So just interested to know your thoughts and everybody will have a chance to comment on like what have been the successes in that area and what are the challenges? Well, I'm sure Tom will disagree, but I, I don't know, uh, we'll see. Um, I think there's been one primary concern of mine, which is tying defamation suits over the last many decades and increasingly over the last several decades to monetary damages. I think that, you know, under common law, defamation had really been a, a kind of reputational claim. And this now, I believe, compromises the spirit of what defamation cases seek or should be seeking to do. Um, I think one of my favorite lines from a scholar is that defamation is a dignitary tort um, and attempting to reduce it to a remedy for economic loss um, is really kind of a historical uh, blind spot then. And so that's one of my greatest concerns. Without going into all of the district and appellate cases, we have seen this rise where so much of these cases ties back to the monetary uh, remedies and the damages sought by plaintiffs. That's part of what inspires my deep concern from a press freedom perspective is that many of these ultimately, when they do succeed, gut those media outlets that have not been able to um, sustain the financial toll. But um, I think beyond that concern, I would look to Tom and Lee who have been litigating and um, far more in some of the, the litigating sort of nuances um, where I have not in the last couple of years. So Lee, do you have thoughts on sort of challenges presented by new technologies and whether libel law has been effective in that context or not? Um, I don't draw a huge distinction between, uh, at least in the defamation area, um, uh, new technologies versus old technologies. Um, uh, the, the the one thing that comes to mind, uh, and, and it's interesting because so much of, uh, and I think Tom will agree with me here, so much of the um, law with respect to defamation in, in the new technology realm uh, revolves around Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, not around the law of defamation. Um, I've read a number of, of articles by people in the tech industry that basically say we could care less about New York Times versus Sullivan. We've got Section 230, um, which provides us absolute immunity. Um, it's, it's even better than actual malice. Um, so um, uh, there is a disconnect there, I think, because um, there's also a body of law out there that um, it, it, since you can't sue the, the platform uh, and want to sue the, you're left with having to sue the, the original content creator. There's also a body of law that says uh, you can't find out who that person is because they have a right to anonymous speech. Um, and, and I think that disconnect um, it, probably has to be remedied in some way. Um, yeah, either Section 230 has to be uh, amended in some way that um, uh, reduces the, the, the absolute protection that now exists uh, in some sort of legislatively defined way and or uh, the law has to give on um, uh, anonymous posters or anonymous speakers so that um, uh, Tom's clients uh, do at least have an opportunity to find out who they are and whether they've got the money to make them worthwhile. And so Tom, in your experience, um, have you encountered new or different challenges because of new technology or is it just 
sort of the same thing in different well, formats? I, I think it's, you know, I think, we're, look, it's a great time to be uh, on all sides of these issues. It's exciting um, to apply these defamation law principles and statutes in a rapidly evolving technological situation. Um, I, I think uh, the courts are working through some of the trickier issues about jurisdiction. And, you know, when things are published on the internet, where can you sue? Uh, and how do we apply old world personal jurisdiction uh, concepts to new world things, viral videos and things that are published everywhere on the internet simultaneously. Same things with concepts that didn't exist decades ago, like hyperlinking and retweeting and all of these sorts of things. We now have to have to graft on to um, defamation law principles that were decided decades ago uh, when there really wasn't a huge change in the media for many years. And you're talking about newspapers, if you're talking about um, you know, three television stations, and you're talking about uh, no internet. And so it, it, you know, the courts are slowly catching up um, to some of applying some of these new concepts, but it's definitely been a challenge with, with these decades old principles. Um, I, I do agree um, with Nora's observation about some of the complexities um, with, that are created by reducing this to an economic tort where the only thing that you can get is monetary damages. And I speak from a very small sample size. I'm not saying that there are not uh, abuses or couldn't be abuses of libel law. There, cer there certainly are. I think that's true in just about every uh, tort claim or every legal claim. There are extreme cases of abuse that are designed to use economic power to, to you know, for just sort of for its own purpose to achieve some objective. And I'm sure that there are cases where people have used uh, superior economic resources to, you know, to squash speech that they disagree with. I, I don't disagree with any of that at all. Um, I, but I do think that focusing exclusively on, on that and those sorts of, you know, s extreme cases uh, fails to give appropriate thought to the, va the vast majority of situations where that's not the case where that's that's where that's not the case at all and many of my clients or potential clients i think they would love a vehicle a legal vehicle um and like exist in some some other parts of the world to have a non-monetary remedy for the defamation um to have a compelled retraction or depublication unpublishing uh something that is false and defamatory or have uh, you know some sort of statement correcting the record i, I it's not about money for many, many of these folks. And if they could get that and they could get that sort of remedy more quickly than waiting for you know six years to go up and down in the appellate courts and the like, uh, a huge percentage of folks would do that. But when we suggest those sorts of concepts, my friends on the other side of the bar um, say, you know, not without some support in the case law, you can't compel speech. You can't, courts can't, should not be in the business of saying to somebody, you must apologize, you must retract, you must deplatform, that that has its own First Amendment consequences. So it's sort of, you know, this is the, uh, an imperfect way through these economic suits for monetary damages, an imperfect way to achieve these objectives because the, the, the others also have downsides, at least, you know, for, for, for speech advocates and for folks that believe that, um, you know, that those sorts of things improperly encroach on speech. And so I would like to see, uh, maybe not to replace economic damages, uh, but at least a different path for the for folks that are seeking that sort of relief, because I think it would, um, it would probably eliminate a lot of the financial burdens on both plaintiffs and defendants, if there is a way to, to have the record corrected, which is what most of these folks want without without having the, the downside consequences for the defendants of having to be bankrupted in order for that to happen and without the financial consequences for the plaintiff of having to spend most of their net worth to get to in the hopes of having that occur. Thank you, Tom. And we have just a few minutes left. So what I'd love to do is um, get your, your quick reactions to one question, um, beginning with Nora um, or Nora's dog, who is very alertly attending this session. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> she really liked the non-monetary avenue, I think. She, that's when she stood up. <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, oh, she's really into it. <laughs> and, and so, I'm, really good with the, I'm really good with the canine set. 
know. You know, Lee, Lee ends up bringing up Section 230 and social media. So I'd, I'd love to get quick reactions on um, what more do you think social media platforms could do to um, address the spread of misinformation and disinformation? Oh, I love that. That was such a wonderful softball for me because this is what I think about all the time now. <laughs> um, well, I, I'll be really brief. I think the number one thing is um, the way our data is extracted and then the way it is used by social media platforms. Um, that is the biggest problem. And I think based on how platforms gather information about us, our profile picture, you know, our attitudes and what we like and dislike or love and care about, whatever the options are, um, those platforms will create a kind of persona and then will um, include or exclude social media users on their platforms from seeing certain content, um, which is a very clear, I think, uh, case for discrimination. We've seen that from DOJ taking up housing discrimination cases against Facebook um, and other civil rights claims that tie to federal statutes that are existing statutes. So I think um, the easiest first step for us is to really take on the kinds of discrimination that is occurring because platforms themselves are responsible. It is not con conduct or content by the advertisers or third parties alone. So without going into the larger new body of, of law around Section 230 and how we may get around it. Um, the, the issue here at, at its core, I think, is how we find uh, pathways for liability for the discrimination happening on platforms when they segment out users and then do that based on uh, data extraction and what are ultimately abusive data practices. And Lee, do you have any thoughts on what uh, social media platforms could do? Um, I do, but before I, I get to that, I want to follow up on something Tom said before, uh, th this whole notion of um, uh, wanting uh, an ability to get a retraction or um, some sort of uh, uh, what I like to call um, reputational restorative relief as opposed to um, uh, monetary damages. Uh, and Tom's right, it's a, it's, it's, it's a difficult area, but um, I would commend to everyone's something called the Uniform Correction or Clarification of Defamation Act, which was passed by the uniform uh, commissioners of you know, on uniform state laws, the people who brought you the uniform commercial code um, several years ago. Um, it's only been enacted, I think, in three states, but uh, it, it, I think quite cleverly uh, and successfully provides a vehicle that kind of uh, it navigates successfully the, the compelled speech on the one issue on the one hand and the concern Tom was talking about on the other and provides real incentives for the media to, to uh, correct and retract um, uh, while at the same time not forcing them to. So um, uh, I, I think that uh, I wish more states <laughs> would enact that statute. Um, on, on the social media platform side, um, uh, I, you know, I, I, I think um, they, they do have First Amendment rights, um, uh, so the ability of government to um, compel them to do things or prevent them from doing other things um, is at least to some extent circumscribed by the First Amendment, but um, uh, I do think that uh, they ought to take seriously, um, very seriously, um, their responsibility as private actors who have a role in disseminating speech to take ownership of the kind of speech that they disseminate uh, and self-regulate, uh, you know, in a, in a meaningful way. Um, I, I'm, I'm not uh, into that, uh, the interstices of that enough uh, to know um, how well they're doing in that regard, but as a consumer of what uh, of what they disseminated, it doesn't appear that they're doing a very good job. Thank you, Lee and Tom. Uh, we've got about a minute left, so I have to put you on the clock for this. But do you have a do you have a quick uh, reply to that? Social media companies, what more could they do? Um, they could do what they say they're going to do. Uh, they could actually apply their terms of service um, in a meaningful way. Uh, they all have these very lofty sounding terms of service that sound great. Uh, about the types of speech that they do and do not allow, uh, but their policing uh, and enforcement of their terms of service, uh, to use a, a legal term, sucks. Uh, they do not uh, apply them in any 
uh, straightforward or haphazard. It's very straight, uh, haphazard way, uh, not predictable, and they don't enforce their actual terms. And so if they did what they said they were going to do, I think it would be a lot, uh, a lot easier. Okay, terrific. Well, regrettably, we are out of time. Uh, so that concludes the panel. Disinformation and polarization. Is libel law a cause and or a curse? Uh, many, many thanks to Nora, Lee, Tom for joining us and sharing your um, experience and perspectives and expertise with us. Uh, thanks to all of you in the audience for being part of the Bar Media Conference this year. Um, I, I hope you enjoy the rest of the programming. Have a great weekend. And with that, I will give the platform back to Peter Canfield. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you all for a great discussion. On a personal note, Lee Levine has been my go-to source for media law questions ever since we were in law school many years ago as classmates. So I especially appreciated his participation. I want to remind everyone that we start the final session of this year's conference in just an hour at 3.30 p.m titled Election Central Season 2, covering Georgia politics and elections in 2022. It will be a lively and perceptive preview of what promises to be yet another wild year in Georgia politics. Organized and moderated by the AJC's political columnist, Patricia Murphy, the panel features some terrific political reporters with experience reporting on politics around the state, including WABE's Raul Bali, GPB's Stephen Fowler, and Columbus, Georgia's Chuck Williams. Again, that's in an hour at 3.30. We look forward to seeing you again then. Thank you.